Hi, I am Richard. Um, I was one of the people here at Lisa last year talking about the why of IPv6 and DNSSEC and things like that. And a lot of us have been hearing a lot about the why over the years. And uh, like was just described, we're working on a new initiative at the Internet Society to help everyone out with the how. We're actually pulling together resources to help you deploy IPv6 and DNSSEC and other new standards and technologies as they come out of the IETF. But before I get started, I'm interested in knowing who's in the room, right? So I'd love to know how many of you here have already attempted your IPv6 deployments, if you could raise your hand. That'd be great. A good number of folks. How many folks here um, have successfully deployed IPv6 and have production grade V6 networks out on the V6 network today? Okay, that's slightly fewer. So, so we've all done a little bit of research and we've all done some work to get started but there's, there's this little thing hanging out there that prevents us from going live. It's different for every person. For some folks, it might be you know, lack of confidence in the tools that are out there to help you manage your network. For other folks, it might be executives inside your organization that don't want you to go live yet, even though you've got all the information you need to do it. And there are various different reasons out there why folks haven't done it. And then we've all got other things coming at us, like the depletion of the IPv4 resource, government mandates, and things like that that are driving us toward this. But we're trying to move away at the Internet Society about talking too much about the why and starting to focus on the how and to put together a resource that will help you, your peers, and other folks that you might come across actually deploy these new standards and technologies using this resource. So move on. I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction to the Internet Society in case some of you here aren't fully familiar with who we are and what we do. I'm going to talk a bit about why IPv6 matters. And I'm going to talk about this new Internet Society deployment initiative that I've already started to describe. So first, the Internet Society. We believe the Internet is for everyone, right? So we're not interested in seeing these closed walled garden networks stand up all over the world and have innovation stop or anything. We want the inter Internet to be open for everyone. We want anyone to be able to come in a permission-free environment and create that next great service. We want everyone to be able to connect and see all the content that's on the Internet. I want someone that is in Europe or someone that's in Africa to be able to see the same content that I can see right here in Boston. Uh, these are the things that we're working towards. We're an international nonprofit cause-based membership organization. So you'll find that the resources that we do provide are free and open and available for everyone to use. We have a diverse global network of members committed to shaping our future Internet. And our mission is to promote the open development, evolution, and use of the Internet for the benefit of people throughout the world. We're neutral and independent, and the Internet Society is the organizational home of the Internet Engineering Task Force. Now, one of the main things that we're interested in is promoting policies and regulation that don't close things down, or speaking with policymakers that don't close things down. Uh, we want to work with things that are uh, technical, that build technical capacity and development of community building on the Internet. We want to make sure that if someone in this room has the next greatest idea that wants to be the next, next Facebook, that all they have to do is take their idea, put it down on paper, talk to some folks, get some momentum behind your idea, get some money to actually stand up your resource, and be able to go out and get some IP address space and put that thing up on the Internet. And when you do that, everyone has access to it. And if your service is great, and if you have a successful product, it'll grow, and you can be the next Facebook. What we don't want to have happen is the depletion of the IPv4 resource, certain types of regulation or other things prevent you from being able to do that by setting up a permission-based internet. And what I mean when I say permission-based internet is that today where you can go just get that IP address space and you can put that service up on the internet and anyone that's behind a large residential broadband network, broadband network can see that service out on the internet that could change in the future and I'm going to talk a little bit further on in the slide deck about some scenarios where that could become a reality in just the next couple of years and if we are to deploy these new standards and technologies it could prevent that it really could so, we want more new stuff on the Internet. We want to innovate without permission. 
We want more people enjoying the same Internet that we enjoy today. We want to be able to support all of these devices that are coming online that haven't been there before. Uh, the next great gadget or device that we're all going to have in our pocket or in our book bag in five years probably hasn't even been invented yet. Or one of you in the room is inventing it right now. We want everything to be independent and collaborative. And we want everyone to know that IPv6 deployment is critical to the Internet's growth and evolution. Now, let me give you an example of that. You guys already know that IPv4 address space is depleting very quickly. You probably know that the distribution model for that has the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority at the top, and you have five nonprofit regional Internet registries under there that distribute that resource on their continents. I'm sure you heard last year, or earlier this year rather, that the IANA resource has fully depleted its IPv4 resource. There is no more IPv4 address space to be given down to the regional Internet registries. Those regional Internet registries each hold their final inventory of IPv4 address space right now. Some of them have already run out of general purpose registration resource for their community. In the APNIC region, you just can't go request IPv4 address space like you did only a year ago. Today, they only have a small number of IPv4 addresses left, and they're only allocating those for special purposes in very small amounts. So if you're a large provider over there, IPv4 has depleted for you in the Asia Pacific region. It's likely going to happen next in the coming months in the European region. Ripen CC will deplete its IPv4 resource. And followed by that, uh, Latin America, Africa, and North America. I think North America kind of won the lottery when it comes to getting that last bit of IPv4 address space from the IANA right at the end. And they have more IPv4 address space than anyone else right now of all the five regional internet registries. But don't let that fool you. You, could look at their, you can look at their website. You can see that they've got four or five slash eights left. But you also have to understand that those four or five slash eights can be consumed by the top 20 consumers of the IPv4 address space in a matter of months if everything collided right at the same time. If all of the wireless carriers needed large new blocks for new deployments that they were coming out with, if new residential pro uh, broadband providers have new services and new devices that they're placing on their network and they needed more address space to do that for their 12, 14 million customers, some of them, they would come in and they would be able to get IPv4 address space to satisfy that. If you had these cloud-based services that were consuming an enormous amount of IPv4 address space and they needed more, if they all came in at the same time, those four or five slash eights could be reduced to just one or less in a matter of months. And the registries know this. So we are running out of IPv4 address space. Now we know that when we do run out of that IPv4 address space that there are ways to stretch the use of IPv4. It doesn't mean that we have to deploy IPv6 tomorrow in order to continue running our services. It just means that when we do turn on new services or we do turn on new customers, that we have to use another layer of NAT in order to do that once we run out of IPv4. And that's exactly what organizations are going to do. So you've got large broadband providers that are going to be dual stacking people's homes. They're going to be giving them IPv6 and they're going to be giving them IPv4. But on the V4 side, unlike today where you get a single unique IPv4 address for that service, for the NAT instance that you have at your house or your small business, you're not going to get that. They're going to create a second layer of NAT inside the provider network, and you're going to be sharing a single unique IPv4 address with tens or hundreds of other people. And that's going to create some issues. There are some RFCs that have been published that talk about the types of services that degrade behind that second layer of NAT, we call it carrier-grade NAT, large-scale IPv4 NAT. But it's not only the large residential broadband providers that are going to have to do this. So these large broadband providers, once we run out of IPv4 address space, are going to realize real quickly that it's difficult to manage and maintain that. And so it may be more cost effective for them to go out on the open IPv4 market. And by the way, there is a market for IPv4 address space now that the registries are running out of it. It's open. The community, accept, the community accepts it, and there's actually money being exchanged between organizations for IPv4 address spaces today. It's going to continue into the future. These large residential broadband providers are going to realize that they need more of it, and they can't get it from the registries. So if you're a small Internet service provider in Kansas, and you got a Class B back in the golden days of the Internet, right, back 
early 1990s, you got a class B for your 100 customers or whatever it was. You figure you're fine. You're never going to have to do large scale NAT on your network to service those customers. But what's likely going to happen is a large residential broadband provider is going to show up on your doorstep one day in the next couple of years, and they're going to make you a financial offer for that class B that you cannot refuse. You're going to sell that class B to one of these larger providers, and you're going to be left with a slash 27 with 32 addresses in it or something smaller than that to satisfy the IPv4 devices on your network for your IPv4 service. And all of a sudden, you're going to be running large scale IPv4 NAT or carrier grade uh, style of NAT inside your network to service your customers. And services will degrade. Gaming has difficulty over this solution. Uh, anything that's latency sensitive, streaming of video, some voice services, it's just not a pretty picture. And in order for us to avoid this, we're going to have to move forward and we're going to have to deploy IPv6. We should get out in front of this and not allow things to break before we get there. But if we do reach that point, it's potential, we have the potential of just a small number of large, very cash-heavy organizations owning the majority of the IPv4 address space. When that happens, if you've got that next great idea, if you're the next Facebook or you're the next Google or whatever it is, all of a sudden you have to ask permission because you're no longer going to a nonprofit registry to get your IPv4 address space. You're going to another organization that holds the resource and you're buying it from them. And even beyond that, if these large organizations control the resource, they may decide that they're in a control position at that point, and you may have to ask them permission for all the eyeballs inside their network to see your service. You may have a latency-sensitive service that doesn't work through these large-scale IPv4 NATs, and you may go to them and have to ask them if you can place your service inside their network, inside those large-scale NATs, so you're closer to the eyeballs. There are a lot of different things that can happen, and these are just a few examples but the way that we move forward and we prevent these things from happening is as we deploy IPv6. So I just wanted to give a few of those examples. So I've already talked about this slide here in the last slide, but these things are all true, and this is a picture that we may be finding ourselves uh, going into. Now, we know IPv6 deployment is already underway. A lot of you raised your hands here and said that you're already doing something with IPv6. And some of you raised your hand and said, well, I've tried, but for whatever reason, it's not in deployment right now. I've done some testing. These are some large providers that have already done some things with IPv6. And you guys have seen this stuff. It's all very public, and it's out there. And there was a lot of activity around this World IPv6 Day event that happened earlier this year. The Internet Society uh, was, name was associated with this, but really what it was was all the participating organizations cooperating with one another make the decision to turn on um, IPv6 at their content for a single day. Because a lot of them had complained that if we turn on production, if we turn on these quad A records and we allow people to come to us over the V6 network, there are going to be some folks that have IPv6 going on on their network but don't have a good link to us and they're going to time out, they're not going to see our website, and there's going to be problems. But they all decided that, well, you know what, we'll do this for a day because it'll be happening to everyone at the same time on the same day. It's like an experiment. And they decided to do that. And that generated a lot of interest. A lot of people are moving forward and they're doing IPv6 now because of something like that. So how many people here participated in World IPv6 Day by putting Quad A up on their, on their website? Wonderful. Thank you very much. We're, we're likely going to be doing another one of those days. So coming up in the next year, uh, we're likely going to do another World IPv6 event. We're going to coordinate or facilitate that amongst operators and internet service providers and, and content companies and consumer electronic vendors. We could target a different segment of the industry than we did before, and it's perhaps going to be longer than a day. It could be a world IPv6 week or something along those lines. It's likely going to be in mid-2012, and there's going to be an announcement coming out real soon about that. Some of the other things that we're doing to help people uh, with their IPv6 deployments and their DNSSEC deployments at the Internet Society. So we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes. We're meeting with various industry segments and we're bringing together those different groups to discuss their deployment. So we'll go out and we'll grab a bunch of residential broadband providers and a bunch of content companies and bring them together in the same room and say, okay, we're talking about chicken and egg and all of these different things here. What can we do to move this forward and get everyone on board? 
And what we found in those small closed groups is that there are a lot of disagreements about having to move forward, when we should move forward, uh, the things that are preventing us from moving forward. But really what we found is that most people are interested in sticking with IPv4 until it's completely gone. And completely gone is just around the corner for us. Now what I want to talk about today is this new initiative that we're doing at the Internet Society. And this initiative is aimed at helping people with their IPv6 deployments, their DNSSEC deployments, and other deployments that come out of the uh, of te technologies that come out of the IETF in the future. But right now it's v6 and DNSSEC. Our internal name for this resource is the Deployment and Operationalization Hub. The Do Hub will work with first adopter community to leverage the knowledge of new technology deployment and create resources that are easy to understand and quickly actionable by the greater operations community. We're going to help organizations do IPv6, do DNSSEC, and other future standards. So basically what we're standing up are these information portals, and we're working with two separate audiences. The Internet Society has very good relationships with first adopter organizations that have already gone out and deployed these new standards and technologies. We are going to leverage our relationships with those organizations, with those individuals, to create resources that are needed by the greater operations community to go ahead and move forward with their deployments. We will be actively engaging with the audience for this resource, the people who need the information, to determine from them exactly what it is that they need. What are the missing pieces of information that they need to go ahead and deploy IPv6 or DNSSEC? We're going to take those requirements from that audience, and then we're reaching out to these first adopters, and we're creating those materials. So it's going to look like an online portal for new standards adoption. It's going to cover these topics here. There will be a knowledge base there with deployment articles, case studies, blogs, social media. We're going to be translating these materials into the UN6 languages so that it's not only available to people that best understand English, but might choose to read it in another language. And we're going to have an eye on meeting series that's already started, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But just a little bit about this, about this uh, web portal I'll be showing you in a minute. But it's important to note here that this is going to be a free and open resource. Anybody can come and use this resource and gain the information from it. You don't have to be a member of the Internet Society. You don't have to be paying any type of fee or anything like that to the Internet Society. This is a going concern of the Internet Society. There have been efforts that have been put up in the past where a group of people or an organization will take some deployment information and they'll make it available to everyone and they'll pay close attention to it for a month or two and then it's no longer a going interest. It's done. They've stopped updating it. The information there has become stale and it's no longer useful to people after a couple of years. We are not doing that. At the Internet Society, we have a staff of people dedicated only to this program. And it is the job of those individuals inside the organization to provide this deployment resource to you and to keep it up to date on a daily basis. We will not only be creating our own content, but keeping in mind that some content out there is already the best that exists, and we're not going to recreate those resources. So we're going out, we're putting together, this group of people will help us review content out there that's already available online and openly available to everyone. We're going to pick the best deployment-related content we're going to feature it from this web presence, and we're going to work with every, everyone who's consuming the information to have them tell us what's missing, what else it is that they need, and with that information, we're creating these new articles to put into the knowledge base, and we're publishing this information on, uh, online for you. We are creating a comprehensive, go-to, one-stop resource for deployment information for IPv6 and DNSSEC. And we're deploying that at the end of this month. So we've been working on this resource for the last couple of months. We're starting to put this thing together. We've roughed out how it's going to be uh, presented to the audience, what it's going to look like online, the types of categories of information we're putting there, the types of questions that we're going to answer for people. But all of this is going to be released at the end of this year. The name of the project or the program will not be the Deployment and Operationalization Hub. We've had people tell us that deployment and operationalization hub just doesn't mean a whole lot to them and that we need to use a different name. So we're considering some brand names for the product right now, and when you see this thing launched at the end of this year, it will be under a different name, but it'll be obvious that it's this program from the Internet Society when you see it. 
We have a location where you can go today and actually see this resource. So we're just getting started. We're doing some work behind the scenes. It's not pushed out here yet. But I just wanted to give you a, a view of what this was and where it's located. Right now it exists at isoc.org slash do. And what we're doing here is publishing a framework for how we're going to present the information to people. And we're asking people, when we go and talk to them about this resource, what it is that they need, what would be helpful to them, what they know is missing, what they know will help their peers. There may be people in this room that would use this resource. We would love to know from you what it is that you need so that we can make sure it exists here at this site. There may be people in this room that have already done this. They've already deployed V6, they've already deployed DNSSEC, and you may be willing to help us create some of these resources. We want to hear from you too, because this is a big priority for us. We want to help the internet community deploy these new standards and technologies. We understand and we get that this may not be everything that you need. So we're going to be doing other things in the future too, like we're going to be featuring consulting organizations. We're going to be featuring training houses. And we're going to cover a little bit of the why still. I mean, we're mostly covering the how, but we still have to cover a little bit of the why. How many people here in this room are ready to deploy IPv6 production right now uh, on the edge of your network or inside your network, and an executive in your company is the reason why you haven't done it yet? Is there anyone in this room that fits that category? None. There are some people that have told us that they do fit that category, so we will cover a little bit of the why there but it's mostly going to be about the how. So I'm going to switch here just for a second. So this is basically, this is the web portal that we're providing. Again, this is free and open. We're concentrating on information for network operators, for developers, for content providers, consumer electronic manufacturers, and enterprise organizations right now. And we're going to change this. We're very flexible with this product as we move forward. But you'll find if you go in, you know, we've already started to ask the questions here. And behind the scenes, we're building in these resources right now. When we launch this product, it'll be launched with the answers to these questions. And it's going to have real deployment information, things that you can sit down and go step by step, and you can actually go out and you can deploy. So some of you have already done IPv6 or DNSSEC in this room, and some of you are looking for information. Um, I'd love to go into a, an interactive state right now with this meeting and just ask the question, is there anything up here that stands out to you uh, that's, that's missing when it comes to the questions that we're asking? Are there certain things that you would like to see at this resource? Because we will take whatever it is that you say you need and we will put it up here. If we can't do it ourselves, we're going to go find the people inside the industry that do have the information and we're going to work with them to provide this information to you at this resource so it's available to you free and open at all times. So I'd like to invite people to come to the microphone and ask questions or uh, perhaps give us some requirements information about what they think they need with this resource. Any type of information you'd like to give us. I'm Jay Faulkner with Rackspace Email and Apps. Thank you, first of all, for all that you've done for us. Um, but something that I ran into when I was running our IPv6 deployment is that we found that even though, you know, particularly, you know, some common open source products advertised IPv6 support and, you know, it, it worked on the surface that when you brought it up to production scale, it had, you know, was orders of magnitude buggier than their IPv4 counterparts. Is there going to be any sort of, you know, validation for kind of common open source stacks um, that might be included in your information, or are you, are you keeping it more high level than that? Now, we've actually started talking to some organizations that are already trying to do that. And an example of one of the projects under the United States government, there's a group of folks out of San Diego that have put together a resource that basically says, okay, this is what this product says it'll do, and, but this is what it really does. Over here, I'm trying to remember the name of the project right now, but it's, a, it's a, an army project right now, I think. So that project exists, and there are a few other projects exist, that exist like that. One of the problems that we've had over the past couple of years through some of these other efforts that have been going on, on in the industry to inform people about these things is because of politics 
or because of money, it hasn't always been the correct thing to do for people to publish that a vendor or a provider or someone else is not actually doing what they say they're doing with IPv6, basically calling people out on the carpet like that. We're not afraid to do that with this project. We're going to do that. We're absolutely going to do that. Um, I'm hearing from you that you'd be interested in us in following that path and actually finding those resources where we could do that type of validation and perhaps even do some of that ourselves instead of just relying on other folks and publishing that on this site. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily be a customer of that. I've already completed the, the yeah. deployment stuff for us, but I'm saying that's definitely something we ran into of, you know, seeing, you know, sort of bugs when you get th th got things up to production scale or, you know, kind of entire important feature sets, especially relating to high availability, right. not being as robust for IPv6 as they are for IPv4. And right. so that, that's sort of, you know, maybe, you know, something that, you know, other people, I don't want them to have to go through some of the same troubles that we did to work around some of that stuff. That's great feedback. We're going to pay attention to that. Thanks. Thank you. Just a suggestion based off that and the other IPv6 talk earlier today. Um, uh, a survey or anonymous survey which published its data saying, we're using vendor X, we are this happy with vendor X, would probably turn it into a marketing opportunity for someone who was competent in a marketing disaster for someone who wasn't which would be a good way of getting attention. Wonderful, thank you, definitely. Please come to the microphones. If you've already done this stuff before, you've got peers out there that haven't done it yet, and they need your help doing this stuff. So on the side of V6 or DNSSEC, is there anything you can see? I know a lot of you have probably already went here already, but are there any things that it doesn't look like we're going to cover that you think need to be covered? Owen? So I don't have something new to offer, but along the, uh, the same veins as uh, what people were saying, there is actually some good data about that uh, already on the Aaron IPv6 wiki, getipv6.info. Um, if you do have experiences with particular vendors' implementations, um, go to that wiki and, and post your experiences there, and I'm sure that Richard's site will be linking and or incorporating content uh, from that location fairly soon, if they aren't already. Um, and the other thing is, it's very important as you begin this process to analyze what your needs are and the way you operate your network in V4. Look at what your capabilities and your needs are in V6. They may not necessarily be exactly the same. There are a lot of things we do in V4 that we do because addresses are scarce. And some of them are okay to bring into V6, and some of them are really good operational practice anyway, and we should bring them into V6, and some of them are really harmful when you look at what they do to V6. So you need to, to, to try and develop a V6 think mindset in planning your V6 deployment and do a, a real analysis of what your needs are, and then you need to do a gap analysis between that and what your vendors are able to provide in V6 and start beating on your vendors as quickly as possible to get the things that you really need into their products. Because that's going to take about a year, usually, if your vendor is cooperative. Right. Now, one of the pieces of feedback, that, thank you, Owen, and, and one of the pieces of feedback that we've gotten from several people is that the vendors aren't completely ready, they're not there yet. And when we're hearing from large providers is that they're really concerned about what's going on in the consumer electronics space because they know that they're going to be deploying IPv6 to people's homes and that the, the type of IPv4 service that they'll be providing will not be the same as it is today. And they own up to the fact that it'll be a degraded service. And they're scared to death of this. So if you're a residential broadband provider and you have competition in a market, so I don't know if all of you here do, but some of us live in a place where there are two residential broadband options. If uh, one of them is a classic telco providing a fiber service or some other type of service, and one is a, uh, a cable operator, and they're providing an IP service to your data service to your home too. Uh, neither one of them wants to be the first one to do large-scale IPv4 NAT. They don't want to be the first one to do carrier-grade NAT in that market. And the reason why they don't is because they believe, because they believe for the very first time a um, lay user residential broadband customer will be able to tell the difference between their offering and the competitor's offering in that market. So imagine sitting in your home and not being the skilled and talented engineers that you are and just being your grandmother or some relative that calls you on the phone all the time to ask you questions about this stuff, right? 
So they're sitting on their network and they're using it and they, and they realize that uh, Netflix is not streaming the same way that it used to, that Skype is dropping calls all of a sudden, or that their kid's gaming service is not working properly and they can't figure out what's going on. They're probably going to call you and you might tell them to do this or they'll probably figure out this themselves. They'll say, okay, I've got a laptop here. They're going to call across the street and say, Johnny, I know you're with the other provider. Can I come across the street to your house and see how this works over there? There's got to be something wrong with my network. They walk across the street to the other provider's network. They get on the network, and everything works fine. This is the provider that hasn't deployed large-scale NAT yet. They go home, and what is their next step? They pick up the phone, and they call a competitor. And they say, how quickly can you come here to deploy to turn on the service at my house? That's going to happen. These residential broadband providers are afraid of this, so none of them want to be first, but they have to do this. One of the other things that they're concerned with is that when they do do dual stack and they do have IPv6 in people's homes, that many of the devices that people are buying today from the electronics store do not support IPv6. And even if it does support IPv6, or even if it's capable of supporting IPv6 with a firmware upgrade, they're concerned that their customers will not do those firmware upgrades. So they're really motivated and interested in getting the consumer electronic vendors moving faster with uh, IPv6 adoption in their products. Sorry, yes. Hi, um, Roland Verreisweg from Surfnet in the Netherlands. Um, one of the things I think really need addressing for DNSSEC is quality of DNS service on its own because many people who have DNS resolvers on their networks have outdated firewall policies that block TCP or they block UDP fragments, um, which can be a real mess if you deploy a DNSSEC and if you want to do DNSSEC validation on your network. Um, and we've been uh, doing DNSSEC for quite a while. Uh, we have a signed domain. And we've been monitoring what kind of problems people who are trying to resolve our domain are having. And about one and two, between 1% and 2% are experiencing fra um, fragmentation problems where their firewall is dropping uh, fragmented large DNS sensors. And that is a big issue. And especially if you combine DNSSEC and IPv6, it gets worse because most of the IPv6 firewalls out there um, will not reassemble fragmented messages and they will just chuck them away. So we see 10% of the people uh, with, uh, who do DNSSEC validation and do IPv6 having problems resolving our domain. Now we are a research network, so um, I mean it's not a problem if some folks can't resolve our domain. Um, but this could be a real issue for commercial parties who are deciding whether or not to sign their domain if there are people out there who are going to have trouble resolving their um, host names. Thank you very much for that piece of feedback. We've heard the same from folks like Olaf Kolkman and people yeah. who are advising the project. And what they've told us is, is very similar to what you're describing here. It says you have to advise people uh, to look at the state of their network and make sure that they know if, you know, doing validation versus not doing validation, what's at stake, and what you need to be looking for. So we're certainly going to be covering that topic space. Okay, excellent. Great feedback. Thank you very much. Hey, how's it going? Good. Uh, so I was at the equivalent of this talk last year, and the, the, the summary of the talk was, it's going to be okay. People are doing this, they just don't want to be the first. Mm -hmm. And you've told us people are doing this, they just don't want to be the first. What's the exit criteria for this? I mean, the title of this talk is, what's the holdup? Mm -hmm. It seems like you're saying the holdup is not enough information. Yes. Is that, do, you, like, do you think once there's enough information, everyone will go, oh, okay, IPv6? We hope. I hope so too. Yes. But so, hope, my, my team's motto is hope is not a strategy. What's that's, our strategy? That's, that's absolutely right. So, so when you talk to people and you ask them, what's the holdup? And we've asked this question to several people before. Many of them will come back and say, there's not enough trusted information out there for me to do this. So if, I, if I'm going for the first time, now you, you guys are different than most of the people that we talk to. I mean, you guys are top of your field, you're coming to events like this, you're collaborating with your peers. There are a lot of sysadmins out there that don't have the luxury of this type of communication with other folks who are coming to these rooms and, and coming to these types of events. So what's the first thing that they're going to do if they have the task to deploy IPv6? They're going to go do some research. And likely what they're going to do is go to a search engine and they're going to type in IPv6 deployment support or something like that and they're going to get a, a lot of answers. Some of the resources that are revealed to them through a search like that are resources that were published in 1999, 2000, 2001, where they're talking about sub-TLAs, NLAs, 
all of those things, and there's not a whole lot of best practices information available to them inside that space. If they're lucky, they're going to find the right resource, and it's going to put them on a fast path, or they're going to know to talk to certain people. There are consultants out there. There are training houses out there that they might use. But a lot of folks don't have access to that. They have to do it themselves. What we're doing with this resource is we're making a freely open and available resource where people can go find this. And what we are going to be trying to convince folks, and you're going to help us decide if we're right or not, provide the best information for deploying IPv6, for deploying DNSSEC, without having to go do that larger set of uh, research. We want you to be able to come to this resource and get the best current operational practices and the best deployment information that's available so that you can move forward and deploy. But we also recognize that that's not going to be enough for some people. So even if you have that information available to you and um, you get it and you can deploy it, there may be someone in your organization that's not going to allow you to do it. And they're not going to allow you to do it because it's new it's a big change for some networks. For other networks, not so much. But they're going to be concerned about it. So they're going to ask for a peer review of your work, and they're going to be looking for a place to go do that. Or they're going to bring a consultant in or some, somebody else for some other reason. So that's why we're going to feature those type of resources, so that they can at least find some vetted resources that are out there that are available to them. But is that going to make everybody move on its own? No. We do believe that people will be moving more rapidly over the next couple of years than they have over the past couple of years, mainly because of IPv4 depletion and what comes with that, because of government mandates. I mean, a lot of us are connected to universities or to government contracts or things like that, and there are some requirements coming down the pipe there if they don't already exist. And we want to make sure that when those people go looking for information to deploy, that we have this resource available to them. So this isn't going to solve the get it moving, get it going thing but we hope that it's going to solve, and we're going to work very hard to make sure it solves the, the information is not available problem, and we're going to make the information available. Do you think, can I ask a follow-up question? Yes. Sorry, I realize there's a line yeah. for me. Uh, do you think there are some organizations who, if they moved, then everybody else would follow? And can we sneakily get somebody on the inside, like very targeted IPv6 people who uh, wheedle their way into an organization and go, aha, IPv6? So there's different influencers out there, right? So there's certain organizations, if they go out and they get moving and they do this, it's either going to uh, create some peer pressure and their competitors are going to go do it too, or it's going to make other organizations feel like it's okay. Look, the big guys are doing it. That was one of the, one of the uh, motivations behind World IPv6 Day, is getting some of these big name organizations to come together and say, look, we're going to do it. And here we, we're going to stand this up. Some of them left Quad A records up and left their V6 content up. Uh, most of them took it down. And so we're going to do this again, and with the intent this time that they don't take it down. And so we're looking for people, big names, big industry players who are going to do this and cooperate with us for the next World IPv6 event with a commitment that it doesn't come down after that week. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm hearing a lot about carriers and enterprise. What's there for this SMB market? Because it's a completely different problem space there. And you know, you don't have the pull with the vendors to say, I need this. I'm right. going to stop paying you millions of dollars a year if you don't put this in. Um, you know, they don't have the personnel. They don't have the teams of 10, 20, 30 people to throw at the problem. They barely have a team of two or three most of the time. Right. And the enterprise stuff is such a complex piece of documentation. You don't yes. have time to distill it down to something that works for your 40 server network. Right. So, so we hear you. Uh, other people have said the same thing to us. We've gotten a lot of feedback over the last couple of months as we've been building this resource and putting together the staff that's going to make this happen. And a lot of people have said exactly what you've said. So one of the things that we're doing uh, with the resource, as I get back to this here, um, is we're separating the information that we're providing to people uh, by different segments. So we've got network operators who are running an ISP or something like that. Down at the bottom, we're calling it enterprise customers, but it should probably be something a little bit different. It should be enterprise networks or something like that. But we'll have a different set of information that's there that addresses their needs. So if you're, if you're running a network for a law firm and you know the VPN services and all of these other services that you're doing for this law firm, uh, we understand that the information that you need or that you want to see is different than what Comcast wants to see. 
And in fact, it's, it's likely some of these larger organizations that have already done this that we're going to gain information from to fill these information gaps. And so we'll be looking for people inside the enterprise space that they can help us put together the, the appropriate material. So for instance, for an enterprise organization, it might start with, this is how you dual stack your web services. This is how you uh, dual stack your mail services. This is how you set up something in Apache that allows your V4 clients to see V6 content until you reach a point where you have to do V6 uh, in some other way inside your network. We're going to be constantly collecting feedback from these different segments to find out exactly what it is that they need and doing our best to supply that information. And we're flexible about how this stuff is split out right now. We can change it. The, the, I would honestly suggest doing away with enterprise because when most people think about enterprise, when they think enterprise, they think GM, right. Facebook, Google, these large enterprises that have a different problem set. Um, and not the, self, the small, medium business don't self-identify as enterprise. And they see enterprise and they think this is going to be this is going to be ridiculous complicated. This is the Coca-Cola Corporation. Right. This is going to okay. be a 500-page white paper I have to read through and distill down and get the 10% the of it that I need that applies to my network. That's a great piece of feedback. Yeah. What we can do is we can create a category here that's specifically for small and medium-sized yep. networks. Yeah, I would, I would highly suggest that. We will do that. I think that that's something that we should do. I think you need the big ones, too. We need the big ones, but as a small, small medium, you're not going gonna to look at that and say, I have to put a month into reading this. Right. And I don't have a month. I got, I'm doing all this other stuff. So. Outstanding. Thank you very much. And, and I've neglected to say <clears throat> there are three people inside the Internet Society organization that are dedicated and committed to only this program. This is our job. We are going to be growing this resource over the next year for you and to keep it open, and that's our job. There are three of us that do this. We do nothing else. And we're all in the room right now hearing what you have to say. I'm there. I'm doing it. You've already met me. We have Megan Cruz from the Internet Society that's working on this program. And Megan is working largely on the outreach space where we're going to be reaching out over social media and we're going to be reaching out to events and organizations to help spread the word about this information and gain uh, uh, new opportunities for creating resources. And we have Dan York, who's also part of this team at the Internet Society, who's responsible for all of our content and working with organizations to provide the information that you say is needed at a resource like this. We are committed to providing this information and responding to your feedback. Yes? Uh, first of all, everything the previous questioner said, plus one. Um, secondly, I keep what, what I'm hearing about is with these migrations, there are going to be unavoidable growing pains. And the problem with that is I'm having to sell pain to my boss. Right. I say, boss, I want to go to you know, DNSSEC. And she says, will that work? And I said, 98% of folks will have no problem. And she said, so you're breaking the internet for 2% of our customers. <laughs> right. And IPv6, you know, 98% no problem, and 2% will be calling going, man, your website never quite loads. And our reaction, because we are rational, self-interested, evil little capitalists, is fine, y'all go first. You know, I, I encourage my customer to, or my competitor to go break his internet first. Right. And when everybody else has broken their internet, then I'll jump out that window. Mm -hmm. um, how do you overcome that? What advantages do you pitch? And actually being able to point and say, look, we're on a white paper as a small business that's recognized for IPv6 leadership might be part of that answer. But I'd be interested in other suggestions for that. Thank you for bringing that up because I don't know if most people realize how much of that is actually going on. That mindset exists inside organizations and I've heard it so many times. That's one of the reasons why you'll find this site being about 80% of the how and the other 20% is going to be about the why. And one of the, one of the groups that we've been asked to target with the why is not, you know, systems administrators per se or network engineers because I, I think you all get this, right? It's the executives inside these organizations that are going to act as a blocker for moving forward because they're either worried about the 2% 
or some other piece of it. So we've been asked to provide some why information at this resource to the extent that it makes sense for that, for that audience. Thank you very much for bringing that up. And, and one quick follow-up with that. The why that they hear an awful lot is because eventually the IPv4 internet is going to explode in a ball of flames, and their answer is, well, it hasn't happened yet. And so I think people who are pushing IPv4 exhaustion are, are counting on that to push the migration to IPv6 are underestimating the number of professional ostriches we have running companies today. Right. It's <laughs> a good way to put it. Uh, j just, just real quick, sir, did you have something that you wanted to comment on yeah. relates to that? I have a response to what you said about 98% of people being merged with IPv6. I'll, I'll give you my one-line case study. Um, there's a company called Cloud 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 And it would be our job to convince the executive ostriches that that actually exists. And, and just real, real quick, we had gotten some similar feedback. Some of the organizations that participated in World IPv6, they were not actually content providers. They were internet service providers, they were carriers, Households. or they were residential broadband providers. And in particular, the residential broadband providers that did have some IPv6 running to some customers or that realized that there was IPv6 going on, on uh, inside their customers' networks on the clients that might cause problems even though there wasn't native v6 running to them, uh, they were worried that they were going to get a lot of telephone calls on World IPv6 Day. And the feedback that we got from most of them was it was a complete non-event. We didn't get telephone calls from folks. Just to clarify the statistics a little bit, um, the, it, the, the breakage level at um, uh, of deploying a quad A record on your site is nowhere near 2%. Um, Google was worried that it might be 0.1%, and I think on World IPv6 Day, one of the slides I saw one of their people present uh, afterwards said that their actual experience was closer to 0.025%. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, David Nolan, I'm a network engineer by trade. So I've been kind of thinking about some of the, the V6 and DNS stuff, sex stuff for a while. Yeah. And where I'm at right now is really in that preparatory stage, right? You know, anytime I buy gear, I'm talking to the vendor, is it gonna be V6 capable? But I'm hamstrung right now by the carriers that we use for inner office network connections, et cetera. You know, we have 25, 30 global offices on MPLS clouds from multiple global network providers and one of them doesn't have any v6 coverage on their MPLS and the other is starting to roll it out and they gave us a list of which sites were covered and it was like 25% of our offices and none of the global ones right yeah I'm trying to phase out GRE on my network uh, I want to go full mesh I want to go yeah right so, so yeah, uh, we completely understand it. There are a lot of, lot of different segments at play here and they all have to get moving. And for one of us that's standing there saying, I'm ready and I'm prepared, I wanna do this, there's always gonna be something today that, that comes up as a blocker. I am not saying that we're there yet, but I'm saying at some point in the future, um, it comes down to a decision about who you're using. Uh, and I don't know what your options are, but if we, there's gonna be a point that we reach in the next next year to where it's just no longer acceptable for a provider to come to us and say we're not doing it and uh, we don't have a firm date on when it's going to be ready. I, we're reaching a point where that's no longer acceptable and I think that they're starting to get it. I hope they get it a lot faster uh, but you know, you know that, that's where we stand with that. It's really tough and then when it comes to the equipment that's inside of our networks and talking to our vendors and getting them moving and getting them ready um, you know, that's, that's a big blocker. I mean, people in this room, you buy a device that doesn't support IPv6 today that's working on your network that does have a, a firmware update that'll make it capable, you're going to do it. But most people are not. 
it's, it's a new purchase for them. And that's real tough. So we're working, we're trying to work as much as we can with all segments of the industry to get as many people going as possible. People have been talking about the killer app for Z6. What is it that's going to get people moving? What is it that's going to get people interested? And sorry to say that uh, V4 depletion doesn't seem to be moving people as rapidly as we thought it would right now. But in the North American region, that's largely because there's such a large holding right now, I think, at the registry. But the story is different if you go talk to operators and uh, different types of providers in the Asia Pacific region. We expect that same type of thing to happen here in North America. So uh, I will we'll say the trend I seem to be seeing is that the internet divisions of the same companies, the, the, the division of the company I buy an internet circuit from has V6 support or you know, will at least tell me where it is on the roadmap, whereas the internal corporate networking portion of the same company doesn't. Right. Or, or it's much farther out or it's much more spot. And that's hard to accept when you realize that that's the case, right, that they just can't provide the service. I've got a quick story to go along with this because I've, I've encountered this so many times. There are some Internet service providers that you call today that have pushed their IPv6 availability all the way down to the sales force. I think you might have one in the room that's done that. Uh, there might be more. However, some companies, they've done their work, they've done their research, they've done their testing, they're ready to go, but they haven't pushed it out to the sales force, they haven't pushed it out to the marketing, they're really not telling people about their readiness here for whatever reason it is. I worked with another organization uh, up until about April of this year. I worked for one of the regional internet registries, and we were doing a big why campaign for IPv6, talking to people about V4 depletion. I stood on a booth here at Lisa for three years talking to you guys. I probably talked to many of you in this room about it. And the, the problem that we were running into is we would, we would stand next to a vendor. There would be an unlucky vendor that was right next to us in the exhibit space. So people would walk up to us and we would tell them the why. And they'd get it. And they knew that there was something that they had to do. They'd walk next door to unlucky vendor. And they would ask the question, is your product IPv6 capable? And the vendor, the person at the, the booth would say, you know, um, I don't have any information for you on that right now. Uh, and they basically say, no, let me get your contact information so that when I have more information, I can contact you and I'll update you, so on and so forth. So the person comes to our booth, they hear, yes, uh, you need to get moving and you need to do it right away for all these different reasons. They go next door and they'd find out what we were saying wasn't really true because vendors weren't doing it. So they had got the impression that IPv6 wasn't happening. Well, the problem is, is that I talk to hundreds of people a day and that same vendor standing next to me would say to each one of them when they went over to ask them, you're the first person that's ever asked me about that. Let me get your contact information and I'll find out some things and I'll get back in contact with you. And then I go at the end of the day and I talk to the person and say, why would you just tell 200 people that they were the first person that asked you about that? I saw 200 of them going over there. And they said, you know what, my company is doing IPv6, but I'm not allowed to talk to people about it. Or they would say, my company is doing IPv6, but they haven't told us what we're supposed to say yet. And that happened all the time, and it was a shame. So there's a lot more progress out there than we know about because companies just aren't making people aware of what they've done. Yes, sir. Uh, Danny Mayer, NTP. Um, I had uh, this discussion two years ago with Rolf Drums, um, who works for a very large networking uh, vendor. Um, but the real big problem is that consumer vendors are not supplying IPv6 supported products. We agree with you. And it's DNS, um, they, they used protocols which were broken 20 years ago. Right. We agree and with unless you. Unless you get them out there, you're not going to get uh, see this deployed. So one of, the, one of the things that's been called out to us is exactly what you've just called out to us, is that consumer <coughs> electronic vendors need to move immediately they need to put this in their products immediately. And we've heard that, so we're featuring information for them at the resource. And beyond that, one of the things that we're doing next month is we're going to be at the Consumer Electronics Show, and we're going to be partnering with Comcast to do a two-hour tutorial for consumer electronic vendors, talking to them about why it's critical that they get moving now and how they actually do this, how they actually uh, put support inside their products. 
Not all of them are going to come to the tutorial. We understand that, but we're going to catch a few of them. We're also going to be actively engaging with the media and the press that's there, talking to them about that. And we're going to target some consumer electronic vendors that we know are not currently advertising their capabilities yet that need to be there, and we're going to reach out to them personally by visiting them at the Consumer Electronics Show uh, to see what we can do to uh, help get them moving or to help them get to a state where they're actually telling people what they're doing because a lot of them are simply just not uh, telling people what it is uh, that they're doing. So that's one of the small things that we're doing is we're reaching out to consumer electronic vendors next month at CES and we're going to be featuring information for them uh, at this portal. But uh, we need more and we understand that and we're looking for ways to do that. Yes, sir. Doug Hughes, DE Shaw Research. Um, another group that you'll likely find that isn't going to support this right away and they're, they're dwarf, I mean, consumer electronics is clearly much more important. But um, typical sort of building automation systems things, your Lieberts, your Emersons, your, your industrial control systems that go on IP networks, that control cracks, that, that control um, even to some extent PDUs and other things. And PDUs are probably a little bit further along. Some of the companies get it. But these traditional big guys who develop your back office electrical, mechanical control systems are still on IPv4 and they probably will be for some time. I don't see them really moving toward it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of them are still using RS-485, right? So IPv4 is a step up from that, right? You know? So they've, they've just got this dumb IPv4 stack passed through on those devices. It's embedded and they, electronics. They yeah. get, you know, and they stick it in there and say, right. hey, I've got the same interface that I have on Modbus on IPv4. Aren't we great? Um, that's good feedback. So that's not something that we're targeting right now. Yeah. And that's something that we can, we can look into. Thank you very much. A um, comment about the consumer electronics uh, environment. Um, as I think everyone in the room knows, very short product life cycles, right. never get updated. Um, those manufacturers only care about whether it's going to affect the sale of the product over the next six months. So until IPv4 crashes, they're not going to care unless you can somehow convince them that some way it's going to sell their product before IPv4 crashes, some logo on the box that will make everybody feel happy about why I should buy this device for right. $3 more than that device. They, they need to feel that pressure. I agree with you 100%. And it's really difficult to get someone like a residential broadband provider to show up on site and say, if my customer next year buys your product and it doesn't have V6 in it, I'm going to tell the customer to bring it back to Best Buy or to whatever store it is. So if we can get a provider to say that, that would per perhaps help a little bit. And in fact, the gentleman that I'm going to be doing the tutorial with is prepared to say that. And he's with a very large residential broadband provider. But it's going to be a small room of people. So that message needs to be made bigger. And I think that the industry as a whole has to come together and say, uh, we're going to be advising customers not to buy a product unless it's got a V6 logo or whatever it is on it. And, and perhaps that gets those folks moving faster. But minus something like that, it's, it's a lot of work, but you feel like you're running against the wind. And, uh, you know, we've done it for the last three years under another project that I worked on, and it's had some limited success. And so we're going with a little bit different approach this year, but uh, it's going to take an awful lot more, and we know that. We're going to continue concentrating on it. It's not just the broadband people. It's mm -hmm. if I want to buy an IP-enabled poster, right. I'm buying that at Target or Best Buy or someplace like that. My broadband provider is in no way involved in that conversation. Right. So one of the things that the Consumer Electronics Association is doing, we've had some talks with them. So they actually put on the CES. Consumer Electronics Association has better communications with consumer electronic vendors than most organizations do. So what we've done is we've reached out to them and we've gotten a really good response from them. And what they've done is they've put together this working group that's for consumer electronic vendors so that they can start a dialogue about IPv6 just among themselves. So it's for their members only, but most consumer electronic manufacturers are members of the CEA. So they're having that, uh, that conversation and that discussion going on. And what they've done inside this working group is they've pulled in the retail providers like Best Buy and some of the other ones to have them engage in that conversation. And some of the retail vendors have expressed an interest to have training done to their, to their sales force to find out what it is that they need to be saying about consumers who come into their store about IPv6. And so there, there is some work starting there, and it's just beginning. And, and I think that will help some, but there is still more that needs to be done. 
Yes. That's, that's a good piece of feedback. I know some people have tried to do some things like that. So for instance, there's been some, um, there's been some content in the past that is pay for only content out on the internet that some companies have come together and said, you know what, maybe our content can help people move to V6 if we only made uh, this particular type of content available on the IPv6 network and made it free, yet you had to pay for it on the V4 network. So some companies came together and they actually did that. And you, you, they were actually pushing a product that they thought would be interesting to people. Yeah. Well, well people, people did try something like that. Um, could you explain to me what's sexy about IPv6 over IPv4? Well, imagine your home network. Every yeah. single semantically addressed, every device doesn't have to have an IT to get to the internet. And end uh, connectivity. Just yep. try to imagine a home user torrenting from four computers all at once with a straight pass to wherever they're connecting to. I'll yeah. tell you what, do you, do you have a business card? Uh, no, I have an old one for a business that's now defunct. Can, Dan, can you give a business card? We're going to give a business yeah. card to you and this is what I would love to be able to do with you if you're willing. So yeah. a lot of people have had a really hard time trying to make V6 sexy compared to IPv4 for consumers. It doesn't mean it can't happen. but. Uh, one of the things that could be attractive to them is this whole end-to-end -end principle of the internet, going back to this end-to-end -end principle, taking out NAT, and perhaps and doing those types of things. It may allow them to do some things that are more difficult right now. It might make some things easier, mm -hmm. but uh, no one has really been successful in selling that to people and letting them know that it is more attractive to a regular consumer. If you could help us do that, we're willing to make an attempt. Uh, the modems, they need yeah. less RAM because the state tables are going to be smaller with IPv6, right? Uh, just their modem, instead of torrenting with 200 connections, they can do with 2,000. Right. And the challenge is, is uh, uh, having a consumer that's not an engineer be excited about that. And, and I think that's a challenge. But we're willing to work with you if, if we can perhaps sure. try to make something yeah. like that happen. We could put together a paper or something. If consumers, yeah. consumers really want this, they just don't know why. If you can help us describe okay. why a consumer wants it, we're, we're interested in working with you. So Dan's going to give you a business card, and if you could please send your contact information to Dan. Okay, we do have to wrap. Uh, just one quick comment, Owen, and then we've got to close this down. We've got another session yeah. coming in. Uh, a lot of us have been trying to make IPv6 sound sexy to a lot of people for a long time now, and it really is a, a challenge because all of the things that are sexy about IPv6 fall into one of two categories from an end user perspective. Category one is, I, I'm not an engineer, I don't know what that means. And category two is, all of my vendors have spent many, many years showing me why I should be afraid of losing all of those protections that NAT affords me, even though we as engineers all realize that NAT doesn't protect anything. In fact, if anything, it's a antithetical to security. Uh, the, the consumers and the end users have spent a lot of time having their vendors teach them that NAT is their source of security and NAT is what protects their home from all the evils out on the internet and allows them to run Windows without fear. Right. You know, we all know that's bunk, but they don't. Right. And making IPv6 sexy by telling them that we're going to take away that protection is not going to seem sexy to them, it's going to seem scary. Thanks, Owen. Hey, before you guys leave, I wanted to point you to this. Please go here. Please look. If you want to help create content, um, we might be able to, you know, return the favor if you do us one. You know, we might be able to help you out and do something for you. We'll certainly credit your work if you help us create content. We'll put your name out there, either your individual name or your company's name or whatever it is. If you need information that's here, you know people that need the information that's going to be here, please go there and help us to find new features and let us know what this actually should look like beyond this meeting. Send us email at dohub at isoc.org and we will respond to you and we'd really appreciate it if you do. Thank you very much. Thank you.